if you are alive, which you are, hello there, there's a good chance you enjoy food. Even if there isn't any food you particularly like, which seems unlikely, you definitely still eat as it's a matter of survival. As with all things, society's tastes change, and foods that were once popular fall out of favor. It's unlikely you've ever sat down to a dinner of liver and onions washed down with a hearty cup of grog, but those were both once common culinary items. And it's not just trends either. New advances in technology also allow for the production or mass production of foods that were once just not possible. The invention of sliced bread in 1928 caused such a monumental shift in the way people ate, both directly and indirectly, that nearly every invention since has been referred to as the great greatest thing since sliced bread. And if you're curious, sliced bread was billed by its creators as the greatest thing since wrapped bread. When it comes to things that will be trendy or the result of new technology, lots of ideas about the future of food get thrown around. A big one is 3D printed food, though this is unlikely to create massive waves as what foods can be 3D printed are extremely limited. Another commonly mentioned futuristic food is edible water. Edible water is just a ball of liquid water contained within an edible gelatinous membrane made using algae. There are even simple recipes for you to make balls of edible water at home, though making them yourself this way wouldn't solve any practical problems, it'd just be a bit of a neat experiment. However, while it's hard to imagine a way that these can be mass-produced and sold that would be practical and avoid issues of contamination, edible water is probably closer to what food in 2050 will be like than 3D printed food. This is because the entire point of edible water is to eliminate all of the waste created by plastic water bottles. The future of food isn't likely going to be determined by what's fashionable or what's trendy. It's going to be determined by what will allow humanity to survive. There are two main factors that need to be taken into account when considering what food will be like three decades from now. The first is that we're going to need a lot more food in general. The global population just crossed the threshold of 8 billion people in November of 2022, and by 2050, that number is expected to climb to 9.8 billion. That's a total population population increase of nearly 25%, and we're going to need something to feed all of those people. Now, Technically, this might not be a problem, as it's estimated that the world already produces enough food to feed 10 billion people, and we're just pretty sh** distributing it. But there is another driving force that will shape what we'll be eating in 2050, and if it affects current crops, then producing food for 10 billion people could be a huge problem. Now, Of course, you might have figured it out, but that change is climate change. As temperatures rise and weather patterns become more severe and unpredictable, there are a few few huge changes that are expected to shape what food will be like by 2050. There are roughly 400,000 known species of plants across the globe. Estimates on how many are edible range as high as 300,000, but the general consensus is at least 20,000 of those plants are edible by humans. However, most of those are completely ignored. Only about 400 different species of plants are consumed by people. Of those, a mere 20 plants make up 90% of the total caloric intake of the entire planet. We don't just mean 90% of calories from plants either. That number includes all the calories from animal protein and other things that people consume. And it potentially gets even worse. While most of the world's calories are provided by 20 plants, about two-thirds of that number is provided by three different types of crops. Rice, corn, and wheat. All three of those crops are susceptible to the effects of climate change, with rice being the most in danger. There are already reports that rice yields are on the decline due to increased temperatures and extended periods of drought, and these conditions are only set to get worse. But these things don't have to be the only crops that are grown. Like we said, there are tens of thousands of edible plants, and some of them are more resilient to the effects of climate change than others are. Plants that require less water and can thrive in higher temperatures will be key, though we are likely to see a larger diversity of plants used rather than picking three new plants to place an over-reliance on. And the importance of plants using less water cannot possibly be overstated. About 70% of global freshwater usage is for agricultural purposes. We have seen droughts become more common and longer lasting in recent years, something that's only going to get worse. Utilizing less thirsty crops as our main source of food would free up that water for human consumption, which is obviously the most important thing. Of course, we could also cut out fresh water as a necessity for plants in our diets by consuming seaweeds instead. Seaweeds are rich in vitamins and minerals, as well as containing fiber, protein, amino acids, and just being really good for us in general. There's even one type of seaweed that tastes like bacon when it's cooked, though it still has the texture of somewhat crispy seaweed. Not only is it nutritious, but farming seaweed would also benefit the ocean as well. Seaweed could help remove pollutants from the ocean and bring other marine wildlife back to the area. And if that isn't all enough, the whole operation would require virtually zero effort. 
Unlike land-based farming, which is labor-intensive, seaweed simply needs to be planted in the ocean floor and then left to grow on its own until it's time to harvest. The only potential danger from supplementing our diets with large amounts of seaweed is that there are some species that people shouldn't eat or shouldn't eat often. These plants are so packed full of nutrients because they are exceptionally good at pulling minerals out of their environment, but as a result, there are specific varieties that are likely to contain higher levels of heavy metal like lead and arsenic. Obviously, stores just wouldn't sell those varieties of seaweed, but even some types that are safe to eat shouldn't be consumed that often. For example, one variety common in New England contains so much iodine that it is recommended not to eat it more than three times per week. Then again, there are already vegetables that you're not supposed to eat every day, so this wouldn't really be different from the way things are now. For years, outlets have been warning people that our current methods of livestock farming aren't sustainable, and they're doing it with good reason. About 40% of annual deforestation is to clear a way for livestock grazing. That's over 5 million acres of trees, an area roughly the size of New Jersey that's being cut down every year. Not only does this reduce the amount of carbon that is being pulled out of the atmosphere by trees, but livestock are responsible for a large portion of greenhouse gases as well. Livestock are most commonly cited as producing 14.5% of the world's greenhouse gases, mostly in the form of methane from burping and farting, though various estimates put this number anywhere from between 10 and 20%. Either way, this is a huge problem and something that scientists have been trying to find a way to deal with. It's often suggested that beans, nuts, and other plants provide a sustainable alternative to animal protein. But these arguments fall on deaf ears because there is one simple reality. People really like animal protein. After all, humans have been eating animals for millions of years, and since our bodies simply can't survive without regular consumption of protein, Protein, getting all of society to agree to give up meat entirely in lieu of beans is just a completely unrealistic goal. We just love steak. So, what if we as a species could still consume animal protein without having to breed and slaughter over 90 billion animals every year? This is the idea behind cultivated meat, better known as lab-grown meat. The process for making this meat is pretty simple. It starts with stem cells, usually embryotic stem cells, that are then cultivated in bioreactors using a broth of oxygen and nutrients. Scaffolding is used within the bioreactors to train the cells on how to grow, creating muscle, fat, and connective tissues for the meat. The process is very similar to what we previously talked about with lab-grown organs for human transplants on this channel. In fact, it is exactly the same process. The only difference is that the growers of cultivated meat don't need to make functioning organs, creating far fewer barriers for successful production. The world's first ever lab-grown burger was served back in 2013 at a London news conference. The five-ounce burger cost a reported $330,000 to create, making it simply a showcase of the potential technology rather than the promise of a radical shift in food consumption. But that price has come down quite a a bit, all the way down to $17 per pound to produce. That would translate to at least $25 per pound for the end consumer product, which is still far too high, but we're only just now moving out of the R&D phase. As companies increase the scale of their production, those prices are expected to drop even further. Cultivated meat has been said to be on the horizon for years now, and it's finally beginning to make it to market. Lab-grown chicken has been for sale in Singapore since 2020, and in July of 2023, the USDA gave approval to both Upside Foods and Good Meat to sell cultivated chicken in the United States. These two companies have been racing to be the first to market, but their USDA approval seems to have been nearly simultaneous. And this is a good thing for consumers, as competition will force both companies to optimize their processes so they can lower the cost of their products. There will undoubtedly still be some amount of livestock farming, even if lab-grown meat becomes the norm, but the potential benefits are pretty huge. It's estimated that cultivated meat plants could produce the same amount of animal protein as livestock farms while using 90% less land and water and producing 92% less greenhouse gases. And those numbers were among the more conservative estimates that exist. Now, this is all well and good, but how does cultivated meat actually taste? Back when the first ever burger was premiered in 2013, it was described as being satisfactory. However, as researchers worked hard to enhance techniques and refine the flavor and texture of cultivated meats, they become nearly indistinguishable from raised animals. A recent double-blind taste test was conducted in which three expert tasters were given both normal and cultivated chicken. Two of them chose to guess which was the cultivated chicken chicken rather than just grading the flavors, and both were incorrect. The smell and texture was identical, but the cultivated meat tasted more like chicken than actual chicken. More specifically, it had stronger flavors than ordinary chicken. That said, all three tasters agreed that while there was a subtle difference between the two, both pieces of meat tasted nearly identical. So cultivated meat companies have, in effect, reached the point where the difference between lab-grown meat and meat from an animal is the same thing as the difference between Coke and Pepsi. People will be able to 
to taste a small difference and may have a preference, but won't really care that much which they consume. That's the hope, anyway, though uh, many people will still have a bit of an ick factor that they need to overcome before eating cultivated meat. By 2050, it's very reasonable to believe that this hurdle will have been overcome and cultivated meat will be commonplace in people's diets. But speaking of an ick factor, next up is insects. Depending on where in the world you live, the idea of eating insects might not seem gross at all. It's estimated that over 2 billion people, or a quarter of the world's population, eat insects on a daily basis. They've been a common part of human diets for at least 10,000 years, though quite likely a bit longer than that. It's believed that the only reason insects aren't common in Western cuisine is because their ancestors were from colder climates that weren't overrun with edible insects. Because it wasn't a part of their original diet, this practice was just never picked up. But whatever the reason that Western civilization has tended to shy away from eating insects, by 2050 it may be common to consume insects all around the world. Insects are considered much more sustainable to farm than traditional livestock with incredible benefits. They require much less space, very little water, and many of them even eat literal sh**. Insects also reproduce incredibly quickly, allowing large quantities to be farmed in a short period of time. For example, a cricket can go from being a newly laid egg to being ready to harvest in just six weeks. And unlike traditional livestock that have their lives cut short, these crickets have already lived out most of their lives, including breeding 600 or more offspring each. The largest cricket farm in North America, located in Canada, is able to harvest 50 million crickets every week. An operation of that scale seems like it would be extremely labor-intensive, but the farm only needs five people to raise and harvest that many crickets. And they haven't even used automation to streamline a lot of the work yet. Of course, it's not just the ease of farming and low impact on the environment that makes farming insects appealing as a source of protein. Commonly consumed insects such as crickets and mealworms are often regarded as being healthier for people than beef or chicken. Whether or not that's actually the case depends on what metric someone is using to define the somewhat subjective term of healthier, but two things are definitely true. There is no metric by which insects were less healthy than animal meat, and these insects have a higher density of protein. That means you can get the same amount of protein by eating less, which is ideal for people that are really grossed out by the idea of eating worms and would like to eat as little as possible. There are a lot of pushes being made to incorporate insects into Western diets, though these efforts typically disguise the presence and taste of the creatures. Westerners appear to be more willing to eat crickets if they're ground into a protein-rich flour than they are to eat whole crickets off the grill. If nothing else, attempts to get people to obtain their protein from insects may make cultivated meat much more appealing by comparison. Now, you've undoubtedly heard of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. However, while most people have heard the phrase, usually in the context of people loudly proclaiming how harmful and dangerous they are, few know very much about how genetically modified crops actually work. Plants are modified for various purposes, mainly to either increase yields or make them more resilient, especially to pests. These crops are perfectly safe, and they've been widely adopted because of the benefits that they provide. For example, over 90% of the corn grown in the US is genetically modified. But since this is already commonplace and the outrage against GMOs has been shown to be unfounded, we can expect genetically modified crops to only expand in their utility. Thus far, we've talked about ways current food will be replaced in the year 2050. However, thanks to genetic engineering, scientists are striving to reintroduce specific foods to the segment of the population that is currently unable to consume them. It's estimated that about 7% of the population can't eat a slice of wheat bread without immediately running to the bathroom, and 2% of children can't eat a peanut butter cup without suffering anaphylaxis. But thanks to science, food allergies may be a thing of the past by 2050. At least, most of them. About 90% of all food allergies are caused by only eight different foods, meaning the number of people suffering from allergies could be quickly and dramatically reduced through genetic modification. Currently, the two receiving the most focus by scientists are wheat and peanuts. Through the use of CRISPR-Cas9, scientists are attempting to engineer plants that will produce fewer allergens. Unfortunately, this won't be a perfect solution. Peanuts contain 16 different allergenic proteins, so currently efforts are focusing on the major allergens. It's possible that not all 16 can be removed, but if that's the case, any remaining peanut allergies should be rarer and less severe. Similarly, stripping wheat of gluten entirely would remove the texture necessary for its use in baking and other cooking processes, but at least one of the three major allergens should be able to be removed moved entirely without affecting how wheat operates as a baking commodity. Ultimately, what we'll be eating in 2050 isn't going to look that different from what you're eating right now, unless you fully embrace replacing all of your protein with insects, that is. The biggest difference will be where the food came from before arriving on your plate. And, God willing, we may even live in a world where no child has to go without the joys of eating peanut butter ever again.